And now, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by retired United States Air Force veteran Reva Foster, and remain standing for our national anthem. I pledge allegiance now, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The National Anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's lonely streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say the that star spangled banner yet wave over land of the free and the home of the Fantastic job, Reverend. Thank you. Now, please welcome the mayor of Willingboro, your mayor, Jarvis Holly. Good evening. I am Darvis Holly, mayor of the great township of Willingboro, New Jersey. On behalf of the Township of Willingboro, I would like to welcome everyone in attendance this evening at our Kennedy Center for our town hall with our governor, Phil Murphy. Over the course of the next few hours, we will have the opportunity to hear our governor discuss his plans on building a stronger and fair New Jersey for all of us. I hope you guys are excited as I am. But before we get to that, I would like to acknowledge a few of my colleagues in public service. Tonight in attendance, we have Willingboro Councilwoman Rebecca Perone, <laughs> Willingboro Councilman Nat Anderson, <laughs> Willingboro Councilwoman Jacqueline Jennings, Willingboro Deputy Mayor Martin Knock, in addition, we also have Burlington County Freeholder Tom Pullian, Freeholder Balver Singh, Freeholder Lathan Tiver, County Clerk, Tim Tyler. We have Mayor Michelle Arnold of Palmyra. We have Mayor Brian Carlin of Burlington Township. We have Councilwoman Andrea Katz of Chesterfield. We have Councilman Dan O'Connell of Delran. Yeah. 
We have Mayor Lorraine Hatcher of Riverside. We also have Willingboro School Board members in attendance. Mr. Gary Johnson. Mrs. Felicia Hobson. Mrs. Tanya Brown. Mrs. Sarah Holly. And Mr. Grover McKenzie. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce the Assemblywoman of the 7th Legislative, Legislative District, Carol Murphy. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for having us and including me in the presentation. Governor, welcome to the 7th Legislative District and our wonderful town of Willingboro. Um, I just have a few words to say and to introduce myself for those who don't know who I am. I am Assemblywoman Carol Murphy, just elected last year. And um, I have had the privilege, while our Assemblyman Troy Singleton moved up to become now Senator, I have the greatest honor to be able to work with both of them, with Troy Singleton and with Assemblyman Herb Conway. So I just wanted to briefly tell you a little bit about what's going on with uh, the Assembly, in addition to what Herb's going to tell you. I have had the rare and extinguished pleasure of being on a few good committees in the Assembly. And one of them, besides Judiciary, where we have ta tackled a lot of the tough issues, such as gun violence, such as safety issues. We have now going to be starting the budget season. We have already had one public session, which was on March 28th in Trenton with the Assembly. And on April 9th is our second public hearing, which I encourage anyone who wish to come out and participate, whether you want to testify or just listen to the budget information that's being provided by other members and other colleagues of our towns, I urge you to do so. If you wish to testify at these hearings, please go onto the legislative website and, or call my office, call the senator's office or call the assemblyman's office. We'll be more than happy to help direct you to how to testify. But we look forward to working with not only the governor and our colleagues, but all of you on making sure that Burlington County gets its fair share. I have had the distinguished and distinct pleasure of meeting with all of my mayors, and now I'm on to meeting with my superintendents in the 7th Legislative District to talk about school funding. And I know that's not on anybody's mind here. <laughs> Governor, good luck. Good luck. I just have to say that. Uh, but with that being said, we are all looking forward, like I said, to making sure Burlington County gets its fair share, making sure our schools get funded, making sure that our next generation of leaders have a place to call home and be able to do the job that we are setting a pathway for them. And I would just like to say again, thank you all for listening to me. Thank you all for being here. Our offices are open for anyone who wishes to discuss anything, any issues, whether it's budget related or other, please reach out to us. And now, Governor, thank you so much again for coming. I would like to introduce my colleague and my partner and the man who will, probably you all know who he is and know that he's probably one of the best doctor assemblyman men there are around. In America, the man who, no, we're all good. So I would like to introduce to you my colleague, Assemblyman Herb Conway. Hi, everybody. Well, welcome. It's so nice to see all of you here uh, engaging in this great democratic process of ours where you'll have to have, have a chance to have this iterative dialogue with uh, our and thank goodness for him, uh, our progressive new governor who's going to lead our New Jersey into the future. I, um, as I reflected on this time, I couldn't help but think 
uh, about what today represents for so many people across this country. 50 years ago today, almost to the moment, Martin Luther King was assassinated uh, in Memphis. And why was he there? He was there fighting to advance the interests of the dispossessed in our country, to fight for their wages, to fight for their jobs. And um, he was struck down by an assassin's bullet. And when I think about his leadership, uh, bringing coalitions of persons together to fight for a better America, someone who used his life. I mean, he, he died at the age of 39. Just think, how, what, what have we done, uh, each of us, uh, by the age of 39? What he was able to do to lead a nation, to lead a world, to show the world how important it was that we all hang together, that we're strong together, that if, we, that if one rises, we are better if all of us rise together. Building coalitions, leading by example, uh, using rhetoric, working with others in coalition to bring change, and looking to a future, a better future for our country. And uh, I think we should acknowledge that, and as I think about what our new governor uh, has been doing already, uh, bringing us uh, back into uh, concert with our local states in terms of the greenhouse gas initiative, uh, working on pr prisoner reentry, uh, standing up for women's rights uh, in terms of their health care, fighting for equal pay, and making uh, decisions that are already turning the page on what has been a less than glorious. Uh, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, always an honor and privilege to come home, so it feels good to be in my home of Willingboro. Uh, let me begin uh, by echoing the sentiment that uh, Dr. Conaway said. Um, today is a special day for all of us. Um, when the, the voice of the drum major was silenced, it's important for each and every one of us to pick up the tune and carry it forward. Now, while we may have an imperfect union, our union is still the greatest in the world. And it can only be full embodiment of its true credo and creed if each and every one of us lives up to the mantra and the legacy that Dr. King gave us to try and make each day better, to try and make it so that people will say about us what they said about him, that we are better for having him come our way. So it is my hope that we will continue to do that, not just on this day when we remember uh, his legacy on the passing, but also each and every day as we carry ourselves forward. The, the hallmark of a great democracy is the ability to have informed and reasoned conversation and help move us forward. That is what tonight is all about. The governor is here tonight to hear from his bosses. And those of you know me very well, no, I never say constituents, I say bosses. And I mean that. And I know he shares that sentiment as well. Because that is the true embodiment of our democracy is we the people it's always been we the people when it works at its best. And when we the people bring our voices to the table, it's incumbent upon us in, in elected positions to listen and do the best we can to make sure that we do what is necessary to make our state, our county, our cities, our school boards better. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce to some and reacquaint to others the governor of the great state of New Jersey, Phil Murphy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this working? Can you hear me? Oh, it's really working. Um, it is a, an incredible treat to be back in, not just in Willingboro and Burlington County, but to be back in this room. Uh, and so thanks for having me back. And let there be no doubt, I am a Democrat. Uh, so I, but that's only yeah, easy now, Reverend. E easy now, but that's only ha half of the point. And, and this is an important point. I'm the governor of everybody in this state, right? And so that's the important point. And that even though we may have disagreements, even though it may take us time to crack the back of some of the things that ail us. Uh, we are stronger, we last longer if we can find a way to get there together, right? So let's, let's all uh, pray to continue to find that common ground. Mr. Mayor, what an honor. I, I always say that, uh, I always say, come on, man, let's hear it for the mayor, Mayor Holly. 
I always say one of the most thankless jobs is to acknowledge all of the VIPs and elected officials. <laughs> and you did it with extraordinary aplomb tonight, so uh, thank you for that. To the great 7th Legislative District, my, uh, my cousin from another mother, uh, Carol Murphy. <laughs> Murph, thank you as always. Dr. Herb Conaway, uh, I think Carol said it in her introduction, just one of the very best and one of my favorite people in the state of New Jersey, Troy, Senator Troy Singleton. And he would remind me if I didn't, uh, that I, I don't mean that point, no, I didn't mean that. He would remind me to say, if I had your hand, I'd throw mine back. Uh, Reverend Martin, where'd you go? What a voice, God bless you. I mean, come on. I mean, the Eagles or the Phillies or the Jets or the Giants or somebody could use you singing the national anthem. Uh, and where's Reva, one of my favorite people? Reva, where'd you go? Reva Foster, God bless you. A veteran, uh, a public servant, a leader in the African-American community, a leader in Burlington County and beyond. God bless you and thank you for what you did, all right? I had a little, at both uh, Troy and Reva know this, I had a little bit of extra time on my hands, so I made a couple of off the, they call off the record stops. I go into a barber shop about five minutes from here, who's in getting a trim but Troy? <laughs> now listen, this is one of my favorite people, I've already said that in the state of New Jersey, you could at least look at neither Troy nor I need much of a trim up top here, but in fairness, Troy was getting it down, uh, getting it, and, 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 it, and the, whatever he did it worked, it looking, uh, <laughs> I went to a men's barber shop, a women's hair salon, a Chinese restaurant, and McDonald's. And uh, for the most part, they were all hopping, right? We all deserve a break today. I'm dating myself. You know who wrote that song, that jingle? Anybody know? Barry Manilow. He's coming out right now. That's not true, but it's out. Before I jump in, I want to jump on uh, for a minute, if I could, what both Herb and Troy referred to. This is an extraordinarily important day uh, in our country's history. Uh, 50th anniversary of the assassination of an extraordinary American, Dr. Martin Luther, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as, as Herb said, can you believe he was 39? I mean, oh my Lord. I visited a veteran's home the other day and I met a passel of veterans uh, who are over the age of 89, which is the age that he would be today had he lived. Um, it's extraordinary. R raise your hand, I I'm 60, so I was 10, I was with my big sister, she pulled the car over and just burst into tears. We had the, the radio on in the car. Raise your hand if you remember wh where you were in the moment it happened. Bruce Davis is here. Bruce, where were you? God bless you. Reverend, where were you? I was in Liberia, West Africa as a kid. And it's still, my, neither, I still remember exactly where I was in my mother's house. Oh, my Lord. How about you, ma'am? I was being sat down by my parents telling me my birthday party was canceled. My 10th birthday party was canceled. Is that right? Because we could not celebrate my party until after Dr. Martin King Jr. was laid to rest. Is, this, is today your birthday? Tomorrow. Happy birthday, ma'am. God bless you. I'm not telling anybody, but I know how old you are because I'm the same age as you are. <laughs> anybody else here, ma'am? And home is here? Uh, yep. Yep. Sir? God bless us all. How about somebody over here, ma'am? So Indiana is, where is that, Evansville or? Bloomington, Bloomington. Okay, I want to come back to Indiana in a minute. Ma'am. Yes, I was laying on my grandmother's floor, Trenton, New Jersey, Street, 327th Street. And I didn't know who he was at the time, but I did cry and explained to me the, uh, the uh, great things that he had accomplished. So I was laying on the floor, watching TV, and that's how I remember. God bless us. Ma'am. And when he came over uh, the loudspeakers that he had passed away, 
Unbelievable, unbelievable. Sir? I was serving with the U.S. Army in Frankfurt, Germany. Frankfurt, Germany. What's that? I was in charge of quarters at night seeking to yep. I had to wake up all the guys in the morning to tell them what had happened. Because he was killed at 1 a.m., if my math is right. 6 o'clock Memphis time, which is 7 o'clock East Coast, right? Does that sound right? So 1 a.m. in Frankfurt. God bless you. I got a question for this young lady. How old are you? Nine. And what's your name? Charlie. Charlie? 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 I love, I get a son named Charlie. You're in, automatically in the Hall of Fame. Any, any comment? I know you weren't alive when it happened, but what, when, when someone says Martin Luther King, what do you, how do you, what do you think about? I think he's a year for what he's done because he stood up to say that it's not right. I love that, man. He, He stood up to say that that about stuff that just wasn't right, and that's frankly as good a summation of what, what he did, right? I, I've got a, a couple of things that hit me, and I guess I'd say this for Charlie, and I'd say this for anyone else who was too young to remember or not yet born. Um, I have three quick thoughts about uh, Reverend uh, King. Number one, I think to this day he gave, bless you, he gave the most relevant speech to this day. In other words, if you said, which American speech is the most relevant today, April of 2018, he gave it. I th we we, we got to put the sun, the, the uh, <laughs> first time the sun's been out in about four months in New Jersey, so I, I don't want to necessarily shut the shades, Charlie, but this is, uh, uh, he gave what I think is the most relevant speech in our country's history for today, and this is particularly for your generation, when he said it doesn't matter what color your skin is. And, and I would extend it, I, I suspect many of us would extend it, well beyond what color your skin is or what God you worship or who you love or how you dress or what you have in your hair or how funny your accent is or where you were born or where your dad or mom work or don't work. It's about the content of your character. I've got four kids under the tw age of 21 and we always say, listen, you don't have to love everybody but give somebody a chance to get to know them on the inside, and then you ultimately, once you know them on the inside, you can make a judgment down the road as to whether or not you're, you're, you're right? <laughs> Secondly, back to my friend from Frankfurt, I was the US ambassador to Germany under, this feels like a century ago, under President Barack Obama. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I always, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I always thought the world of him, but he's looking better and better by the second. <laughs> by the second. But I used to do town halls like this all over Germany, as we're doing them all over New Jersey. And the topics were different, but not entirely. So Martin Luther King Jr. was a topic there. And I used to ask the following question, mostly of kids. So these were not Adults, like most of us are here today, not everybody. Thank God for Charlie and a few others. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do you a favor. I'm going to do you a solid, as they say right now. Ready? I'm going to stand right there for this kind of. Um, uh, I used to ask the following question of German kids, and never once did they get the answer right. And there's the smart kids. Name me the only American for which, named in singular, is there a federal national holiday in the United States, the only person in our country's history for whom there is a holiday, federal holiday, singularly named for this person. I'd get George Washington. I gotta move now, I apologize. George Washington, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, John Kennedy. I never got, and then I would say, you know what the answer is? It's Martin Luther King Jr. And then I would say, and this was when President Obama was president and all of us felt like maybe it was getting toward the end of history, even though we knew it wasn't. I would say, in every case, what I've just said is all you need to know about the United States of America. Uh, and I still think with great pride as Americans, we should say that's the guy 
that we rally around and say he's the singular person. We have President's Day. We have Memorial Day for our blessed veterans. Uh, I suspect many veterans here tonight. Veterans, who want to raise a hand? Veterans, let's hear it for our veterans. We have, uh, we have Labor Day for our brothers and sisters in labor. Let's get it up for organized labor. But there's only one holiday named for one person. Last anecdote. And again, I'm, I'm saying this for the young folks here. And then we'll talk for a few minutes about New Jersey and we'll throw it open to what's on your mind uh, and questions. Uh, if you haven't gone to school, where's, where's my friend from University of Indiana? Indiana University? Okay. You probably know this, ma'am. What's your first name? Levon Johnson. Levon? Mayor of I know who you are. Nice to see you, Mayor. <laughs> Holy, ma I'm Phil Murphy. Nice to see you. <laughs> Holy cow, I'm sorry about that, Mayor. So you're gonna appreciate this. If you know this story, go home and look it up. And the story, it's extraordinary, by the way. It's one of these oh my God stories. It's about Robert Kennedy, the day and night Martin Luther King was killed. Anyone know this story? He's running for president, okay? He's in Chicago going to Indianapolis to make a campaign stop. He gets the, he's on a, what they call a puddle jumper. You know what that means? Like a 10-minute flight or a 20-minute flight? Small prop plane. He gets the word as he's getting on the plane that King has been shot. He scraps his whole speech, not knowing whether King's alive or dead, and starts rewriting frantically by hand on the uh, plane. He gets off the plane, and he's told King is dead. Everybody, because they're beginning, as you all remember, that night there were riots in almost every big city in America. He gets the word from his people. Remember, tragically, we're going to find out two months later that his security was not probably what it needed to be. His own people, the mayor of Indianapolis, a Republican mayor who became a friend of mine because he was a big German-American stalwart named Dick Luger, Richard Luger, Senator Luger from Indiana later in life a big transatlantic guy, begs him not to go to Indianapolis. Kennedy says, no, I'm going. He goes into the African-American big neighborhood in Indianapolis, and he personally breaks the news that King has been killed. So there's no cell phone. Uh, cell phone, that's, there's no, I suspect for you there's no cell phone left either. Uh, <laughs> there's no smartphone. There's no internet. Nobody's texting. There's no CNN. He personally breaks the news. And I'll leave you with this. I want to leave you with a couple of quotes because I ask myself today, could we see someone in today's world, uh, particularly given, I don't want to get too partisan here, but particularly who we got in the White House, <laughs> could you see any of the following being said? And by the way, this is the most remarkable thing he said. For those of you who are black and are tempted to be filled with hatred and distrust, at the injustice of such an act against all white people, I can only say that I feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. This is the only time in his life he acknowledged what had happened to his brother, and I quote him, I had a member of my family killed, but he was also killed by a white man. And you know who he's referring to, right? <laughs> President John Kennedy. He then, he, Kennedy used to travel around uh, with a book of uh, Greek poetry, which he pulled out, and the end of his remarks, which, by the way, are extemporaneous, other than uh, he, he quoted the poetry but from Hart. Aeschylus wrote, and I quote Aeschylus, who will not be with us tonight, by the way, in, in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until our, in our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And then Kennedy said, what, and how relevant is this today, I may ask rhetorically? What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or they be black. Let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let, it, let, us, let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Extraordinary, right?
two months and one day later, he would be shot and died then the next day, which is an extraordinary uh, reality. But the notion of pulling people together, and as the mayor knows, in one of the few cities in our country, and I think you could count them on one hand, that did not riot that night was Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, because we had, you know, we saw not only a great man leave us, but courage of another great man come in and speak to it, even when folks told him he shouldn't do it. So God rest uh, the soul of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Senator Kennedy and all those who have uh, been courageous and gone before us. So let's turn to New Jersey for a minute or two, shall we? Uh, and again, thank you so much for coming out. I'm humbled by uh, how many of you have come out tonight. And it's, again, very good to be back, not just in Burlington County, and in Willingboro, but to be in this very hall where I've got some very good memories. I, I mostly want to spend a few minutes on our budget, uh, but when we throw it open to questions, that's what we're here to talk about. If you've got some other things that are really on your mind, uh, we're not screening questions. I'm going to ask my colleagues, Petra, I know Hillary's here, Brianna, I was told Justin was also going to have a microphone. Is that true, or just the three of you? Just the three of you. Uh, and they'll help me figure out uh, the questions um, in a few minutes. And again, my, my, my point is, and I f apologize to my Republican uh, brothers and sisters here, I am going to get a little tough on the prior administration, but I'm not saying it for the sake of scoring political points, but I want to make sure everybody understands the frame uh, through which we are looking at this state right now and the, the state that we inherited 80-something days ago. Um, and so we are, we've inherited a state which is uh, a fiscal mess, so we don't have enough money, uh, that is highly unequal with big gaps in our state across different communities, uh, an economy that has not grown, uh, and an economy when it works, it works for too few of us. So I campaigned, and we're now governing on a very simple premise. We need a stronger, fairer New Jersey that works for everybody, not just some of us. So stronger means we got to grow it. Fairer means we got to close the gaps. And uh, working for everybody means we just can't have it work for a few of us. There are 9 million of us who call this great state our home. Now, I should say right up front, I am an incredible optimist. I think we are victims of a failure of leadership, not because our people got bad or our location got bad or our systems like education got bad. We screwed it up. You know, it's, we are, uh, leadership did this to us. I guess we can bemoan that and say the glass is half empty. My view is if it was man-made, we can undo it with man-made action as well. And that's what we're striving to do. I mentioned the stronger part of it. You know, we've probably left 20 to 50 billion dollars of economic activity on the table if you compare New Jersey's growth rate to other states, either all American states or states that look like us. We used to dominate the innovation economy, the infrastructure economy. The first one is, you know, you can make the statement we were Silicon Valley before there was a Silicon Valley. It speaks to who we are. You know, think of Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison and Albert Einstein at Bell Labs and Sarnoff Labs, and you know it better than I do, all the examples, the pharmaceuticals, the bio, the life sciences. The, the infrastructure economy is the other big one that we used to dominate, and that one's not that complicated, right? If innovation speaks to who we are, infrastructure speaks to where we are, right? Uh, and so that's roads, bridges, rails, tunnels, buses, ports, clean energy, whatever it might be. Uh, in each of those economies, again, it's through failure of leadership, we let our edge go. We didn't lose all of our edge, but we lost enough of it that we don't grow anymore. So when we say strong, we mean we got to get growing again. I would argue that we had a, a state that we've inherited that was run on a narrative. And the narrative was shrink government, starve it, use whatever gimmick you need to use to say you didn't raise taxes, 
even if that gimmick didn't have any rhyme or reason other than to say I didn't raise taxes, uh, to rip our progressive soul and take us three standard deviations to the right, so doing things like just for the sake of being able to say it, defunding, zeroing out funding for Planned Parenthood, or vetoing every gun safety law that came across one's desk just to be able to say you did that. And so that's a personal narrative. That may be somebody's national aspiration narrative, but it sure as hell ain't what our state was all about. We continue, right? And you need not look any further, and we're going to talk about school funding. One of the first acts and then one of the ongoing acts of the last administration is give the millionaires, and I'm not a class warrior, by the way. I want people here, we're all one family. We all rise and fall as one. But let's call it out for what it is. While the middle class was being ravaged, while the dreams of those who look up and aspire to get into the middle class were being broken, and by the way, that was me growing up. I grew up, my dad didn't get out of high school, my mom did. Uh, we didn't have two nickels to rub together. She made sure we all went to college. He made sure we cared about the community and public service and engagement. Um, now, I grew up, like a lot of us, in the Kennedy-Johnson America, when you knew if you worked hard, you stayed in school, you stayed out of trouble, you didn't screw up, you were going to do better than mom and dad. That was the, the deal. Well, that deal in this state has been unraveled and put on its head. The fact of the matter is, and I, by the way, if I do nothing else, I'm going to put a bank that if you work hard, Charlie, you stay in school, you get good grades, stay out of trouble, by the way, you're going to do better than mom and dad. That's what I'm here for. That's my job. That's my job. But instead of the wind being in your back and in your sails like it was for me, and those are the most important years of my life. Those are the ones that burn still deepest within me. We've now got a state where the wind is in your face. And so one of the first things, again, I'm not, I got nothing against folks who make it, but one of the first things that was done is to give the wealthiest among us and the biggest corporations some pretty juicy tax policies, either cutting taxes or tax incentives. And I guess in and of itself, that's called trickle-down uh, economics. I'm here to tell you that's never worked. I don't know why. This is that definition. I don't know what that commercial is where the guy keeps walking into the glass wall with his lunch, you know what I'm talking about, and laughs. Uh, or the get stuck in the turnstile. You, 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 you know, the definition of craziness is you beat your head against the wall time and time again, and you think there's going to be a different outcome. Well, that's the way with trickle-down economics. It's never worked. If that weren't bad enough, at the same time, for the past eight years, there's one school funding formula that's ever been blessed by our state Supreme Court. That was at the same time as the millionaires and the corporations were getting those breaks. That school funding formula, over a period of eight years, was underfunded by over nine billion, that's with a B, dollars. That's the reality that we walk into. And so, I'm raising my hand and saying, you know what? Rome was not built overnight. No, that, that's not what they said in Rome, is it? Rome was not built in a day, excuse me. It wasn't built overnight either, was it? Any, uh, any Roman emperors here with us? I know Barry Manilow is late. And, uh, um, we can't solve all of this overnight. And so I also, I want folks to understand that we're on a journey. And we're on a journey together to get back to where we know we need to be. And by the way, sure as I'm standing here and you're sitting here, we will get there. We'll get there together. You have... So we put our budget out a few weeks ago. And this is a good process in New Jersey. If the governor puts it out, uh, previews it with the uh, leadership, and then there's a great give and take with legislators. Uh, we got two great ones right here over the course of the next couple of months to get to a good place of common ground. I feel really good about what we put forward. The reaction has been really good. Again, you have to understand we're not going to get there overnight. 
but this is a major statement that we're getting back to doing the things that this state used to do really well, which for me is a simple calculus. Investing again in the middle class and in the dreams of those who aspire to get into the middle class. That's what New Jersey's always been. And that's what we will be again. So are we going to ask the wealthiest among us, the wealthiest literally as millionaires among us, to pay a little bit more in their fair share? We're going to do that. Are we going to ask, are we going to ask big corporations to say, you know what? And big hedge funds, bless their hearts, I've got very little sympathy there, for the record. Uh, we're going to do some good housekeeping and close loopholes that a lot of other states have already done. Again, not class warfare, but we're going to do the smart stuff. Are we going to do that? You betcha we're going to do that. Um, um, I don't take this lightly, so I want to make sure you know every single dollar in anybody's purse or pocketbook or wallet counts. Uh, but one of the gimmicks that the last administration did, just so they could say when they were raising the gas tax, they could say we didn't raise taxes overall, was to cut three-eighths of a penny off the sales tax. It wasn't scored. There was no analysis. There was not, if we do this, we'll get that. It was pure and simple. I don't want to be my predecessor, the guy who raised taxes over here and didn't do something to offset it. That's a gimmick. That's not sound tax policy. Uh, I don't take it lightly, but we're going to undo that. And we're going to put it back to where it was. <laughs> and by the way, this is the deal, and I'll, I'll give you 30 seconds of color on this in a second. If, you, if your household is making somewhere between $75,000 and $125,000, somewhere in that range, undoing that sales tax gimmick is going to cost you $85. I don't take any one of those dollars lightly. You have my word. But I will promise you this, that in exchange for that, and I'll tell you in a minute what that is, we're going to invest multiples of that into, that into that family over a series of years where, where folks look back and say, man, that was the best $85 we ever spent in our lives. Okay? We'll do a few other things. You know, if there's a question on this, I'd, I'd like to take it because I'm a former national board member of the NAACP. Bruce, I love you. Uh, you got a few NAACP hats in here. Let's give it up for the world's oldest civil rights organization. I say that because the adult use marijuana initiative is first and foremost. It begins and ends with shrinking the inequities. We have the widest white, non-white gap of persons incarcerated in the United States. A big reason is low-end drug crime. So there are, there are a few other at-the-margin revenue items, but we're, that's where we're going to source the investment we're going to make. And what's the investment we're going to make? We're going to make some historic investments. Number one, I want to talk about K-12 through uh, school funding. Again, we have been, right, and, and by the way, Chesterfield and Kingsway. Um, bless you. Let's hear it for Chesterfield and Kingsway. I would just say that there are a couple of guys, but it says, I stand with Kingsway. In fact, they are standing. I just want to make that, just want to make that point. Uh, there are three things about this that I want to make sure everybody understands. Number one, this budget has the, the highest historic investment in public education in the history of the state, period. Okay, that's a, that's a K through 12, K through 12, period. Secondly, I've already said this, but I'll reiterate, we're digging out of an eight-year period where we underfunded public education by cumulatively $9 billion. Thirdly, it is true, thirdly, uh, people say to me all the time, well, yeah, but there are inequities, and you all live this, right? Uh, there's one school funding formula that's been blessed, as I mentioned, in the history of our state by the state Supreme Court. Uh, do we need to revisit that formula? Are we, do we need to do that with the legislature? You betcha we do, okay? So we need to do three things. Dig out of the hole, put a historic amount of money in, and we gotta get at the table and figure this formula out, not for 2008, but for 2018 and beyond. Count me as an ally in that fight. You have my word for that. So it's, not just K through 12, by the way, although that's a big chunk of this. Our view and my personal view is you get to the promised land by investing in education. 
If you did nothing else, that's what I, if you said to me, where's your buck going to go? It's going to be education. So what else are we doing in this budget? We're beginning the process. Again, we can't get there in one year. I wish we could. We're beginning the process to have pre-K, not just in some districts, but universal in this entire state. Again, it's going to take us, it's going to take us, again, we're digging out of a big hole. It's going to take us a while to get there, but we'll get there. Um, we have made higher education in our state out of reach for too many of us. Whether or not you want to go to an associate's degree route, you know, two-year, or you want to get a university degree or beyond, um, you know, this is a state that has historically lived and died by public education, certainly, but also by our institutions of higher education. And the, and the point of being not just having great institutions, but that they were accessible and affordable. Uh, and so we have said a couple of things. Number one, we will begin just as we're doing with pre-K, although I think we get there sooner. We're going to make community college free over a period of three years for everybody. But even if you're not going, and by the way, I mean community college for somebody who just graduated from high school or somebody who's my age going back to school yes. and everybody in between. Yes. We're making college generally affordable for a lot more people. So these, something called tuition assistant grants, you've heard of these tags? Yes. We have 3,500 of them budget, 3,500. Um, we're increasing the Education Opportunity Fund by millions. Back to high school, we have a, in the budget, a computer science for all initiative. Um, under the theory that if you're going to claim to be an innovation economy leader, you've got to have kids who come up and learn it at every level. Um, if, not if, I'm going to say when. When we achieve our aspiration, this is a point, this should be a point of particular pride, because I don't know about you, I'm sick of finishing 48th, 49th, or 50th. Uh, enough of that, right? Uh, when we achieve our aspiration of universal pre-K and free community college for everybody, we will be the only state in the nation to have done that. And that is a big deal. <laughs> Couple other quick thoughts before we throw it open. I mentioned infrastructure. Uh, I'm, I'm going to single out NJ Transit, and I'm not singling out the, 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 the very uh, qualified, hardworking men and women who go to work at NJ Transit every day. They deserve our praise and thanks. But I will make the point on the list of what we've inherited, NJ Transit, whether it's bus or rail or both, used to be uh, a national model for commuter rail. It was held up as one of the great rail systems in the country. I believe it is still today the third largest uh, commuter rail system in the United States. Um, but we all know what happened. It became a laughing stock. The state support for it was cut by 90, at its worst moment in the last administration, by 90%. Fares over that same eight year period are up 36%, I think. I always used to ask people, is your commuting experience up 36%? <laughs> whether you're on the rails or on buses or, or both. So we've put new management in place. We have uh, started an audit to figure out how that money got spent. And we have put, as we have in education, a historic investment into NJ Transit. Uh, I think our, our specific number is an investment of $241 million to make up for, again, you're making up for, in this case, eight years uh, of lo you know, long time digging out of holes. Money isn't everything, and we will not get there overnight. Uh, but with new leadership and audit, really good men and women who work there every day, and finally the money they need. I mean, they were taken from the capital budget to fund up, fill up the hole in the operating budget. That's no way to run any business. Uh, we will ultimately get that right. We're already seeing signs, knock on wood, the weather over the past couple of months has probably not been helping us, but we're beginning to see signs. But we have to do more than that. We got to get the light rail system in the southern part of the state uh, that will make it a lot easier, the Gloucester Camden uh, light rail. And up north, Hudson Bergen, similar reality. Uh, we got to get the gateway tunnel built, uh, right? 
Almost no matter where you live in this state, the Gateway Tunnel is a game changer because it's a northeast corridor item. I was with the governor of Pennsylvania a couple of weeks ago. He said that's a big deal for us uh, because it's a national sort of economic, national security matter, northeast corridor. It's not just a New Jersey item or a New York item. It's, uh, it's a 20% it's a of the GDP of our countries in the northeast. I, I, I'll leave you with a couple of quick ones. Um, We've had a love affair of giving tax credits out to big companies. I got nothing wrong per se with tax credits, and I certainly want as many big companies happy doing business in New Jersey as possible. I speak to their chief executives literally all the time. I happen to be meeting back to back with two of the biggest company CEOs tomorrow. And they like what they see, by the way. They get it. They understand that if we take a little pain over here in terms of raising the revenue, the investments we're making are game changing particularly because they get the middle class as it goes, so goes our state. They get if you build the dream so folks have those ladders to get up into the middle class, as I was fortunate enough to do in my life, uh, that you've got a stronger state, you've got the workforce that they need to fill the jobs that they're desperate to fill, et cetera. But we have probably, uh, in exchange for the love affair uh, that we've had, I'll tell you, I love you, uh, with the big companies, we've turned our back on small businesses and startups, um, and we've got to undo that. So we're reviewing at the Economic Development Authority all, and we're going to do this, the legislators know this, uh, Herb and Carol know this, that next year the current set of incentives are up for review and renewal. And I'm not a hockey player, but you remember Wayne Gretzky, a great hockey player? He had this line, why are you so good? And he said, because I go to where the puck is going, not where it's been. <laughs> And so we need our incentives, we need our whole mindset of our economy to follow where the puck is headed, not where it is now or where it's been. And so as much as I would love Amazon to come into New Jersey, and please God, they'll do that. Uh, and we're all in on trying to get that to happen. They gotta, you know, it's got to work for everybody, not just for them. It's got to work for us too, right? I, I want to get the next generation of companies born here. You know, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, you know, you get, get a startup culture back into the state. This is a shocking statistic. Again, this does not happen by accident. And I'm not making any of this up. It happens to has the added virtue of being the truth. We have 15 technology incubators in New Jersey. New York, and I don't know the number in Pennsylvania, New York has 179. 15, 179. Venture capital that goes into funding startups over the past five years in New Jersey, down 40% in the rest of the country up two times. That doesn't happen by accident. You, sort of, you have policies, you have incentives, you have a structure or con a construct into which you can, you can drive that and move that needle. So not just the big companies, and God bless them, we want them, but I want to get the small and medium-sized companies, not just to, to, if they're here, to stay here and to be happy that they made the decision to stay here, but also if they're not here, to come here. I think our realistic objective, if you're a company or you're a household, uh, I, I did not, I grew up in Boston. Please don't hold that against me. Uh, my wife's from Virginia. We planted our, we, easy now, we planted our flag, in our case in Monmouth County, uh, to raise our four kids. Best decision we ever made. We did not come here, you a Monmouth? You a Monmouth man? Monmouth County? Atlantic, just checking, just checking. I thought I, I, I thought I had a little connection there with you. We did not come here thinking this was the low cost place to live in America. It wasn't, you know, don't be offended, it wasn't Mississippi or New Jersey, right? It was, it, New Jersey was that state you paid a premium to live in, but you got a rich basket of stuff back. And you said, you know what? It's worth it, right? Is that fair? I think that's the case for businesses as well in our best days. Right? Okay, I know I'm not going to be the low-cost provider, but you pay a premium and you get a lot of stuff back. The problem in our state, the premium has gone up, 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 and up. And I don't mean just property taxes. And by the way, I'll be damned if we don't crack the back of the property tax crisis. And we got a bunch of stuff in our budget for that as well. But I mean, I mean non-tax tax. I mentioned NJ Transit or the cost, of, the cost across the Delaware or the Hudson or... Healthcare or 
or even property taxes, with all due respect to the cap, it's still, they're still up 19% over the past eight years. So we got to crack the back of this. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I say that because I, I want to make sure that um, we're getting back to that good value for money place. It's, it, I pay something, I live in New Jersey, but I get a rich basket of stuff back. That, to my way of thinking, is the real ob objective. And I reject completely this us versus them uh, dividing us. That's, that, those days are over in our state. No more of that. Um, somebody called me uh, on, when I was running for uh, governor a pro-growth progressive. I'll take that. I'll take that. Right? We're going we're gonna to grow this economy if it kills us, and we will. And there's an enormous amount of upside. But I'll tell you something, just because you do that doesn't mean you're not progressive or that you can't be progressive. So I think, you know, as I speak to chief executive officers, as I speak to households, just as important is that good value for money equation, the value of New Jersey, just as important are the values of New Jersey. Increasingly, companies, households, thinking about where do I want to bring my kids up? Where do I want my workers to bring their kids up and go to school and grow up and grow old. They're not just looking at the hard math of what are the, tax, what are the taxes, what's your investment in public ed or higher ed or pre-K or transit. Uh, they're looking at that. But they're also, you know what they're also looking at? Um, are you, do you have enlightened immigration policies that, that promote safer cities? Count me in, New Jersey will have that. And we do have that, right? Do you care about women's health? Are you going to fund Planned Parenthood? Well, yes, we have finally funded Planned Parenthood. How do you treat our LGBT brothers and sisters? Well, we treat them just well in New Jersey, and we're going to get better at it, I promise you. Tell me about your gun laws. Do you have strong gun laws? Do you have weak gun laws? Are they smart gun laws? Are you working with other states as we are? I want to be head of the class in the United States of America on our gun safety front. And by the way, another myth says you can't do that and at the same time protect and respect the Second Amendment. I completely reject that. You can, you can have gun safety and you can respect the Second Amendment. And we will. Or a big one, how do you treat your environment? How are you feeling about offshore drilling? I don't know about you, I'm not feeling too good about that. Are you going to rejoin that regional greenhouse gas initiative of states? Even though our president has pulled out of the Paris deal, are you going to abide by it? The answer is you betcha, we'll abide by it. And so it's not just the value equation, it's the values that we stand for as a state. And I believe if we get that right, if we do it together, and it won't be overnight, but if we f are, we're laser focused, in particular on the next generation. You know, I want to, I said this before, and I'll say it again here as I close. I, I want to be the guy that you look to and say, whether we always agreed or not, he was looking at what's best for the next generation, not what's best for his next election. That's the guy I want you to think of. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming out, for hearing me. I want to throw it open. Samantha, you want to say a couple of good housekeeping? Uh, I do. We got to get to the fun part, Governor. Come on, come on down to the, uh, into sure. the uh, I don't want Washington. to feedback you. Um, just like I said at the beginning, we're going to throw it open to some questions. If you have a question, you can raise your hand now. Some of our staff members will come <clears throat> around and, and pick people out of the crowd. If you are asked to, uh, if you are chosen to ask your question, please keep it succinct and to the point so we can answer as many questions as possible. And Governor, this one's for you. If you can keep your answers as succinct and to the point as possible so we can get to as many, that would be great. Anybody here soccer fans? Uh, Samantha deserves a yellow card for that last comment. <laughs> Just trying to keep us on track. I mean, come on. You know, one thing I did not mention, I hope somebody asks me, and that is what are we doing about the opioid crisis? So, which is a scourge in Burlington County, it's a scourge in every county. 
I've been told I should go to our, our, our able-bodied uh, colleagues. I'm going to start with Hillary. What do we got, Hillary? Thank you. We got Hello. a question here. Hello, Governor Murphy. My name is Val. Hey, Val. And um, thank you. you. Nice How to are you? meet you. Honored. I appreciate your time and coming down here today. My first question, well, my question is, um, Nero tweets while America burns. But outside of that, um, with the legalized marijuana, are those, once we get it legalized and taxed, is there a way that we can make sure that that money is dedicated to funding education and maybe reentry programs? And yep. as far as some people who are currently incarcerated for yep. uh, marijuana crimes, being able to go to the front of the line to maybe get licensure or whatever the case may be. Is it Val? Val. And where, do you live in town here? Or? No, I live in Trenton, New Jersey. Trenton, New Jersey. Thanks for schlepping to us. Yeah, no Let's worries. hear it for Val. Good question. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Um, so this is a good one, and I, I want to give uh, give me a sec here, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. I want to make sure Petra and Brianna are, are at the ready with other questions. So I mentioned a minute ago that uh, in, there are sort of two separate but very important uh, marijuana-related uh, arenas. One is medical. The other is recreational, or what folks now call, I think it's a more accurate assessment, adult use. Okay? Uh, let me just say quickly on the medical, uh, we got to that first. Uh, it is much more life or death. Um, and if it's not life or death, it's certainly quality of life. Yeah. Um, we were one of the first states to have a medical marijuana system, uh, but it's been gummed up for the past eight years. We only have about, I think, 17 or 18,000 folks who participate in it. Uh, Michigan, which has a similar population and is, came to it after we did, has 230-something thousand. Arizona has 130-something thousand, smaller population. Um, it's, a, it's a crime. Uh, because by opening it up to more afflictions, by making it less stigmatized to doctors who have done both as of two weeks ago, uh, you can get this into the proper hands of folks who desperately need it, whether it's for epilepsy or Tourette syndrome or musculoskeletal challenges. And by the way, the alternative, and this is maybe a good comment on the opioid crisis and what we're doing about it, the alternative for a lot of those people is opioids. And it's not the only reason by any means, but you know, folks dispense these opioids like they're M&Ms. Uh, and folks get hooked on them, usually alongside adjacent with a mental health or a physical health challenge. Uh, and the medical marijuana is not addictive and has proven to be an alternative at that front end uh, pre-addiction. Pre it's also, by the way, proven to be a good uh, weapon in the recovering addiction phase as well. So opening medical marijuana up wide, which is we're doing more locations. Again, always regulated. You need prescription. This is going to stay uh, in the light, transparent, above board. We think is going to save lives, and it's certainly a lot of lives, and will save the quality of life. The recreational piece is different. I mentioned uh, that I mentioned in passing that the big driving factor for me is social justice. We have the widest white, non-white gap of persons incarcerated in the United States. And I'm not going to, listen, I'm, I'm not going to stand for that. It's just not, it's unacceptable. It is not entirely by any means due to low-end drug crimes, but it is overwhelmingly due to that. If you're an African-American young person, particularly if you're a guy, you are three times as likely to get busted for a marijuana charge than you are if you're white. And by the way, the usage across races is virtually identical. So if we didn't make a dime off it, uh, count me in to crack the back of this horrible inequity. Now, I'm also... <laughs> I'm also glad we didn't go first. Because every state that's done it have done some things well and they've made mistakes. Uh, and now the, the number of states is beginning to build up. And so uh, we're, we're going to school on that. It is in our budget at a modest number. So we know that this will take, and listen, I'm a dad of four kids under the age of 21. I did not get to this overnight. I don't blame people for having a hard time getting to this because I didn't get there overnight as well. 
But when you look at the alternatives, the current state, I know there are a lot of folks with, a, with, with goodness in their heart, and I can appreciate this because it's alluring who say, listen, let's just decriminalize it. Uh, here's the problem when you do that. It keeps the business in the hands of the bad guys. It doesn't protect our kids. And we don't get to regulate and tax it. And so uh, while I understand why folks may want to do that, it doesn't crack the back of what brought us to where we are today. Two things on money. Uh, number one, we hadn't thought about dedicating it, but I like the idea. So uh, let, us, l let me think that one through. We had, we had, in this budget at least, it's a modest number, by the way, as I mentioned. Uh, we had put it in as a general number. We didn't tag it to anything. But it's, it's not, a, not a bad idea, Val. So that's one that I, I want to think about with our team. If you can, Samantha and others, help me. Secondly, what is offensive in communities of color, and I can appreciate this, and we don't have a good answer for this, but hey, Jim, how are you, buddy? I didn't see you there, pal. Just to give us a chance here to get reacquainted. Um, is, is, and it is true, that folks in urban and community of, communities of color will say, you know what, if you look at the other states, uh, the usage among persons of color stays high. Hey, Eric. Uh, but the profits, the venture capital, the operators, the owners are overwhelmingly white. Uh, and that's a bone that sticks in people's throats. And I don't blame them. So on that one, I don't have a crisp answer for you tonight. You didn't ask that question, but I want to make sure you know it's also a money question that, that we are trying to figure through. And we're open-minded to some creative solutions that says, you know what, we're not going to let that so-called wealth transfer happen and still allow this thing to be a scourge in our community. Let's hear from Val again. Who's up, Petra? We're going we're gonna to bounce around here a little bit. I apologize. That was a longer one than I promised you. I won't do that again. <laughs> hey, ma'am. Hi, Governor. Um, my name is Sue, and I'm a teacher, and I've been a resident of Medford for 40 years. Um, my big concern is the environment. And um, I know you sound like you're an environmentalist, and I'm concerned about drilling off the coast of New Jersey, but I'm extremely concerned about drilling in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. I've been to the meetings. I'm a member of the Pinelands Commission. Not a member. I, I promote them, and I've been to their uh, meetings. You provoke them. No, promote them. Promote, promote them. them. Said provoke no, them. I don't provoke them. <laughs> Um, I was to the meeting that was on Route 73 in the hotel, and by the time I got there, which was at the beginning of the meeting, the vote had already happened. Um, four governors be
use a diplomatic phrase, um, for minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, you compare us, again, I know Pennsylvania not as well as I know New York. You compare our situation to New York and it's night and day. And again, that doesn't happen just by accident. It happens because there's public policy that goes into making stuff, you know, outcomes happen because of policy inputs. So we've committed to, where's Reverend Derek Green? To do the, what's the study called again? Disparity study, Disparity study which has been on the shelf for eight years. Um, to get that finally up uh, and running so that we can have the data and make the assessments and move that needle dramatically. Uh, and I mentioned, by the way, I, I, back, back to the adult use point, it's even easier to do if you're starting an industry from scratch. So that's one where I mentioned in passing, I want to make sure that we get that dynamic right in the minority women-owned business piece of that. Uh, but we also got to get it right for the industries that are out there running it as we are. Thanks, Sam. Brianna, what do you got? Good evening. My name is Patricia Myatt, and I'm a Willingboro resident. Hi, Patricia. How are you? Well, <laughs> come and shake uh, your hand. I love your T-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm actually representing some of the senior citizens that live in Willingboro. We have a problem in terms of PSENG, and I know you were talking about big corporations. Oh, you good? Okay. Um, noticing that in the last five or six years, PSENG seems to be double and tripping, triple charging us service fees. For example, last summer I had one day, one month, where I used like $3.85 worth of gas, but yet my service fee was $15 and change. Holy cow. Okay, I've noticed the same thing with the electrical side, which made me go solar so that I could afford to pay my bill because three and $400 a month is a lot of money to spend. Okay, Did you call them up and ask them what the story oh, was? Oh, sure. It, depending on which representative you speak with, you'll get a different story. Yeah. I'd like to know, how can the governor get involved in helping us to get them to stop taking so much service fee? I mean, if I had to pay $25 or $45 a month, I could understand that. Sure. But if I use, let's say, $60 worth of gas, my bill is going to be $180 yeah. or more. So, so that's, that's just service. Yeah, yeah. I so understand. when you total it all up, it's going to be almost 300 bucks. Yep. Uh, what's your first name again? Patricia. Patricia. Let's hear it for Patricia. Great question. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a crisp answer because I don't work at PSC and G, but they are regulated by the Board of Public Utilities. Uh, they say that this has been approved. Yeah. So I, I want to, I want to help our folks. Can you help me on this one, Adam, or somebody? I want to follow up with Joe Fiordaliso, who's our the president, I want to get more information and understand what's going on. That sounds completely wrong-headed and unfair. Uh, so let me look into it. Um, again, they're their own company, but they have to play by the rules of the road. And the rules of the road are pretty prescribed with a public utility. You probably saw I got pretty upset with the utilities the past few weeks with these storms. Uh, PSE&G actually did a better than average job, uh, but we need to be a lot better prepared Given the amount of money folks pay for service and their electricity, we got to be a lot better prepared for storms uh, because we had some cases, and again, admittedly, they were more JCP and L, uh, where people are out for 12 days without power. Uh, so the fair deal is something that we care a lot about. So can you bear with us? Can we get a, can, Patri can you figure out, Brianna, how to get a hold of Patricia? Thank you for that. Hillary, where are you? Oh. We get one back here. Okay. Hi, Governor. Hi, ma'am. Uh, my name is Pam. I'm a healthcare navigator. I work for a Pam. Pam, yep. Nice to meet you. Nice Pam. to meet you. I work for a private nonprofit um, as a healthcare navigator under the ACA. So, as you know, uh, the ACA is being dismantled. I had noted. Yes, <laughs> piece by piece, and we're very concerned. <coughs> I'd like to know. You know, uh, we actually had our budget cut slashed by DHS by six hundred. Sure thousand dollars so yep. we're wondering very concerned about what the future holds in New Jersey if they continue to dismantle it without replace repeal what what plans do, can you share with us that you have for covering people with health care in New Jersey everybody get that from Pam so um, I've refrained from speaking about because I don't want to be too partisan but I also retain my First Amendment rights uh, I've refrained from speaking too much about what's coming at us out of Washington. 
but a lot of stuff is coming at New Jersey, and it's not particularly good. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions, but unfortunately, overwhelmingly, whether it's tax policy, environmental policy, immigration policy, health care policy, uh, it's almost overwhelmingly not good for us. And uh, destruction brick by brick of the Affordable Care Act is high on that list. And you, you know how many times the President and the Congress, Republican Congress, tried to uh, make it disappear and go away, right? So it was like a whack-a-mole game. Uh, they would pound it and it would, it would keep popping up. Having said that, they've undermined it, as you know. They've cut the navigator budgets. They cut the enrollment budget generally. They have shrunk the enrollment period by half. Um, and so on this particular one, I'll give you two thoughts. One, we have to fold the tent here in a few minutes, so I'm going to be more efficient with my answer. The first thing is uh, we're going to continue to fight it with our congressional delegation every step of the way. Okay, every step of the way. Uh, and I will just say to everybody, look at the gun marches, look at the women's marches. We need to bottle that energy, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on. I know where I am. And make sure that they get bottled toward elections, because elections have consequences. Right? So I'm not patting myself on the back, but we have Planned Parent funding, not because the legislature got it because God bless them to their credit. They've gotten it every year for the past eight years, but because you all elected a different governor. Um, we have equal pay for equal work uh, coming at you because you're, you've got a governor who will sign that. You've got a governor who will sign the sensible gun safety laws that have been vetoed time and again. Elections matter. In each of those cases, if I had not been elected, they would not have been signed. So we will continue to, aggress so again, particularly for our young people, elections have consequences. And you've got a congressman here, i got to say it, who was at the leadership of trying to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, and he was a leader in trying to screw us on the state and local tax deduction. So you do what you got to do. It's not my congressman, but I know what I'd do. And again, elections have consequences. So. Work hard. I love you all. I can't, I can't acknowledge that, but I love you all. Uh, keep the, help us keep the, the fire high in Congress, which we will do. If we change the House, if not the Senate, but at least the House, that whole dynamic changes. Secondly, we'll consider whatever we have to consider. I was the U.S. Ambassador in Germany, universal health care brought to Germany by that left-wing lunatic, Bismarck. Uh, this should not be ideological. Just as it's a right to get K through 12 education, it ought to be a right to get health care. The, the, the answer is yes, but it's crazy expensive. Uh, Pam asked what I consider setting up a state marketplace. The answer will consider anything. California priced that out. Over 10 years, a modest price tag of $400 billion. But maybe more practically, I know it's a micro point, but I will tell you we're committed to it. I signed an executive order first couple of weeks I was there. We're going to advertise the enrollment period through every single government agency, right? Which will help your line of business. Did I just get you wet? I apologize. I just, now I'm spewing water on, uh, uh, on my bosses, as uh, Troy would say. Um, we're going to advertise this everywhere. We're going to put money into it. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure folks know how to sign up, when to sign up, where to sign up. Great question. One or two more, we've got to go. Petra, where are we going? Hey, sir. Hello, Governor Murphy. How are thank you, you man? for coming out to Burlington County. I'm not sure I could get the hat there, but it looks good. Oh, thank okay. you. Um, I'm from Hainesport. As a volunteer at Woodford Cedar Run, high season, um, policies like the Endangered Species Act matter to me. Yep. And I've heard, oh, sorry, that's right. not loud. <laughs> and I've heard on the federal level they're trying to repeal that. Yes. So what would you do to uphold it? Great. What's your first name again? Connor. Connor, great question. Again, this is, Connor, permit me just given the hour of the night, but I want to make sure you, you, uh, that I answer this, but I also answer it not just specifically, but more broadly. So the answer is, 
without having been asked that question before, although I heard the same thing you have, we will try to figure out a way to compensate for that at the state level. Uh, and I have to tell you, I met with our attorney general today, who's terrific. First sick American attorney general in the history of the United States of America. Right? Almost our whole conversation was this. What do we do to compensate for what's coming at us out of Washington? Uh, and again, forgive me, it's gonna, I'm now going to go from, so the answer is assume that we're going to try to figure out ways to mitigate that. Uh, but go to other areas. Today we spoke about consumer protection, finance bureau, which the Trump administration wants to shut down. So we have a plan, if that's the case, that we'll establish some sort of mitigating uh, uh, presence in New Jersey. Um, we fight things like the SALT deduction. We're fighting the constitutionality of it uh, uh, legally. Some cases we'll, we'll have a legal fight. In other cases, it might be a health care fix. Uh, it might be, um, uh, I am a huge critic of the way they're going about immigration in the whole raids in the middle of the night of otherwise, you know, crossing the wires between uh, law enforcement, which we all want safe communities, but crossing that wire into immigration policy, which may have nothing to do with law enforcement. Um, I, I'm a big believer in safer cities. And so in that case, we've said we want to establish an office of immigrant defense. So it doesn't necessarily undo what Trump is doing, but it gives folks a, a one number, one point of contact to call. I believe in safer cities, by the way, not just because I'm a nice guy. I hope I'm a nice guy, uh, but because they're safer. So if you have every resident in a community who feels comfortable about coming out of the shadows and engaging with neighbors, with community leaders, with elected officials, with members of law enforcement, import importantly, what do you have? You have a safer community. And that's what I'm committed to. So the answer is yes. Maybe one more. Hillary, where are you? Hillary, last one. I apologize, but go ahead. It's a school night, so thank, I got to... Thank you so much, Governor. I'm really thrilled that you're here in the name? southern New Jersey. I'm Miriam Stern. I'm from Mir Cherry Hill. You might have seen us in the news recently about our school safety issues. Uh, a little bit embarrassing I spoke for to your mayor. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for your involvement, and I'm I'm here. Um, we are also 50% underfunded as Kingsway is, so yep. you know about that. I'm yep. going to air a little more dirty laundry for Cherry Hill. Um, we have a you brought pictures. Major cracks in our foundation, but much worse than that, we have so many rats in our high school oh, that the God. students have names for them. And here's a, ch a picture from a child. A child took this in our high school. Okay. So. We are spent, we, our taxpayers are being asked to, to raise oh. $150 million of a bond yep. because we're so underfunded. Yep. And, and the entire budget is, is meant to go for the entire bond. Sco uh, school security. Yep. And I've asked our school board, could we find other means of, of funding security issues now that it's a big national topic? And um, our, our 50 year old, 19 buildings that are 50 years on average That's in age full of rats. I, I just don't know what else to do. So, and so can we help with security? I know it's, no one would believe it. By the way, since the school funding formula came out, we have doubled our number of, of free and reduced lunch students, which means that- I thought you were gonna say double the number of rats. <laughs> probably that too, unfortunately. Um, we went from one in 10 children to, to one in five. Yep. That's our demographic now, we need help. Yeah, yeah, listen, I hear you, Miriam. I mean, that's, this is, it is, it is extraordinary. You know, not that long ago, we were a AAA bond-rated state. Not that long ago, a lot of the schools were new and in good condition. Not that long ago, we fully funded public education. Not that long ago, we had a plan for universal pre-K. Uh, we had a plan for offshore wind. Um, we have, you know, it's like a drunken sailor. We lost our way here. Uh, so I don't, this is not words. I, I'm asking you to, I want to work, I'm, I'm your guy. I'm not the guy who, I, I, I'm your guy. Uh, and I want you to believe that, uh, that we can't get there. You know, Rome is not going to be built either overnight or in one day. Uh, uh, but we're going to get there. And, and, and it, it's unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. Now, one point I want to leave on, which is one element of your question, which is school safety. So you got to know that, um, and, and I want to thank you again for having me here tonight, because this has been extraordinary. 
School safety is, you know, the safety and security of residents in the state is job number one for me, period, full stop. Uh, it dwarfs everything else. And so we, as you can imagine, uh, obviously well before the first meeting I had as governor was with the uh, state police uh, superintendent and our director of Homeland Security, and we reviewed the security profile of the state in every dimension we could, including school safety. Um, and we had a dinner a couple of weeks after that with a lot of different law enforcement agencies, including a lot of feds and other states. Again, school security, part of that. We then obviously have the tragedy of Parkland. Uh, by the way, I was on today with, if you see a guy who's an extraordinary advocate named Fred Guttenberg, you may have seen him debate Marco Rubio. Uh, he is the cousin of a very close friend of mine, and Fred and I have become, they lost their blessed little girl, Jamie, that day, who was 14. Another freshman, by the way. Um, and uh, he and I have sort of bonded. Uh, he loved the fact, for instance, the investment council, the pension investment council last week, divested of an automatic gun manufacturer, which I thought was a great thing. And he today, he today was trying to figure out how we could proselytize that and get other states to do that. That's not the purpose I bring this up. So needless to say, we revisited the school safety question immediately. Um, and I'm, not, I'm never going to spike the football and say, listen, I think we've got a good protocol. Even though we do, we don't take any of that for granted. Uh, and whether that's local law enforcement, state, Department of Homeland Security, federal authorities, um, it's, it's a, there's a vigilance that's required. And you have to wake up every morning expecting you've got to fight the next war, not the one that was the day before, or in this case, the tragedy at Parkland. But I want you to know it is a huge priority for us. Guns, I have, I, I'll, I'll conclude with this, guns are a part of this, right? So you, you both need safe and secure schools and protocols that work among local and state, including federal authorities, but you gotta figure out a way to crack the back of uh, the illegal gun reality. Uh, and I would just say on this one, let's continue to hold Congress's feet to the fire because we need national legislation. <laughs> Secondly, Secondly, I'll sign, we already have good gun safety laws. They could be better. Uh, my predecessor vetoed a bunch of them. The pen is hot and ready. Uh, when those bills get on my desk, they will sign them the second they get there. The Assembly has already made their move. The Senate, I'm sure, will, consi will consider these sooner than later because there's a moment in time here nobody can ignore, uh, particularly among our youth. And I give the youth in particular, our generation has failed. They're going to shame us and prove us wrong. So we need stronger gun safety laws in our state. We need the, the federal action through Congress. But I will tell you, in the, in the interim, over 80% of the gun crimes in New Jersey are committed with illegal guns that come in from outside New Jersey. Thank you. So we got to figure out ways to cut that down. I, I'm proud of coming up with an idea called States for Gun Safety, which we started a few weeks ago with other like-minded states to share, to share Share intelligence, share information. Um, even if we get that number from over 80% down to you know, 70%, we have saved, I guarantee you, we'll save lives. Um, I hope that coalition grows. It's not the answer to our dreams. By the way, part of it is gun safety research. The feds outlawed gun safety research in 1996. Uh, it was just ironically put back on the budget. I can't believe that. Uh, but we put in our budget $2 million for gun safety research, particularly smart gun technology. And if you're not a gun person, and I'm not a big gun person, it's a fairly straightforward idea. If the gun is yours and it's your biometrics, it discharges. If it isn't your biometrics, it doesn't. That saves lives. So, not necessarily tomorrow morning, particularly those awful rats, but help is on the way. Consider me a, a brother in arms. Uh, and on school safety, by the way, that is a here and now. That is this moment in time. I promise you it will continue to be this moment in time. I want to thank Willingboro. I want to thank Burlington County. I want to thank the elected officials. God bless you all. We'll see you back here soon, all right?